Welcome to my sales masterclass. My name is Beryl Solomon and we're about to go through an adventure, a journey together. We're going to turn you into the top salesperson in your industry or in your sector. For the past 15 years, I've had the opportunity to work as a professional sales person. When I was 17 years old, I founded my own events production business called More to Life Entertainment. As a teenager, I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars convincing people to come to my events. When I was 20 years old, I went to go work for our family business, selling metal in the metal recycling industry. I took our family business from $8 million and brought it to $30 million in revenue in just eight years. It was an amazing experience. And I did this all through the sheer brute force of just knowing how to sell. When I was 28 years old, I opened up my own company called Wealthy Commercials, where we produce videos for corporate clients to help them sell their products into the market. I grew that company in just three short years to over $3 million a year in revenue. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we're not selling container loads of metal here. We're selling literally videos. Do you know how many videos you have to produce to generate $3 million of revenue? So I've done phenomenally well my whole life in sales. Every position that I was put into, I was able to accelerate my growth, accelerate my personal revenue because I mastered this thing called sales. In this program, you too will learn how to master sales. You'll learn how to become an expert. You'll learn how to increase your revenue. And we are going to go on a journey together. By the end of this, you're going to be the top person in your space. Maybe you're already in sales or maybe you're looking to get into sales and you just don't know how. So let me first define sales. Sales is the exchange of a commodity or a service for money. Everybody needs to know how to sell. Selling is the cornerstone of what gets things done. So maybe you've never even been in sales before. Maybe you never had the official title, but whether you know it or not, you've been selling since you are in diapers. Let me give you an example. When you are a baby and you are crying, for your parents to give you a bottle. You're selling them on the fact that your bottle is more important than anything else in the world right now. And if they want peace, they better give you that bottle. So your payment to them was actually peace in the house for them to give you that bottle. You have been selling your whole entire life. I'd say that every person actually goes through at least a dozen sales experiences throughout a day. You're in the car with your wife or your husband. You want to go for Italian. They want to go for sushi. Whoever is more sold on their preference, that person will ultimately win. And if you get good at sales, you're going to be able to increase your revenue. You're going to be able to get job security. You're going to be able to finally start reaching the potential that you know that you're worth. So whether you're a salesperson or not, it doesn't matter. By the way, even if you're not a salesperson, you still had to make a sale to get yourself the job that you have, right? To get yourself hired is essentially a sales experience. What are you selling? You're selling yourself. There's a lot of different types of sales. So you could be selling a product like watches, you could be selling an intangible thing, which is your time, just like a lawyer. So when you know how to sell, you're able to bring in ultimately an unlimited amount of revenue. And it's really just what is the product that you're going to sell? Because when you know how to sell, you're able to take your destiny into your own hands. Sales is usually the highest paid person in a company. And let me explain to you why. You want to be as close as you possibly can be to revenue. Let me give you an example of somebody who's not close to revenue. The janitor of a company has nothing to do with what that company does. Often the janitor comes in even after hours when the business is closed, but a salesperson is intimately involved with the revenue. The higher you are on the food chain with the revenue, the more your salary will ultimately be. So, a accountant, for example, he's close to the revenue, right? He's close to the revenue stream, intimately involved with what's going on in the finances of the company. So their salaries tend to be higher, but most often than not salespeople, their revenue is the highest in the company. Why? Because they are the closest to the revenue. And when you're close to the revenue, you get a little slice of that revenue, right? So you could either be selling for a company or you could be selling on your own. A lot of people want to start a business today, but the problem is they have no idea how to sell. 
I say this all the time. You could have a cure for cancer in a pill form that cost $1, but if you don't know how to sell that, if you don't know how to get it into hospitals, into medical companies, if you don't know how to push your product into the market and sign a contract, you're not going to make anything, even if you have the best product in the world. So before you start a company, you have to learn this thing called sales. You have to learn how to convince a person to trade money for your product or service. And once you do that, you're going to gain an incredible amount of security in your life. Talk about job security. We just went through a pandemic here with COVID. Everybody that was not close to the revenue stream got cut, got fired, got laid off. Why? Because they're not close to the revenue stream. I could almost guarantee that the great salespeople in every industry, in every company were the last people to get cut. It was never even thought on the owner's mind because they need those people that are close to that revenue. In this masterclass, we're going to learn the mechanics of a sale. We're going to learn how to implement this thing that we call sales. And by the way, sales is not a dirty word. You know, when people say, what do you do for a living? I'm a salesman or I'm a saleswoman. It's not a dirty word. It's a beautiful thing. A salesperson is able to get products into the market at a price that is able to sustain the company and ultimately sustain the economy. And we're going to learn just exactly how you can become a master salesperson. So now that we've discussed that sales is important and you know that you have to learn this incredible skill, now the question is, what do you sell? So as we mentioned before in the other chapter, that there's a lot of things that you could sell. Products, services, or time. So when you're going to go choose what it is that you would like to sell, it should always be something that you are passionate about. You don't have to love the thing. I know a lot of people that are crazy about sports. It doesn't mean that you have to go sell sports memorabilia, but you should like what it is that you are selling. Guy that works for me, his name is Elias. He used to sell life insurance. The guy hated selling life insurance. He wasn't passionate about it. It took so long to get a sale. The paperwork was out of this world. So he decided that he wanted to go try a different thing that he wanted to sell. Came to work for my company, happens to love doing sales for videos. Whatever it is that you're selling, the profit margins should be very high because your time is valuable. So I remember last week I went to go order a bouquet of flowers for my wife for the Sabbath and it took me half an hour on the phone with this florist to figure out what type of flowers she was going to sell me. Half an hour of her time, what color, what this, what that, and I said at the end, how much is the bill? She said it's $56 for the flowers and I said, wow, she just spent half an hour of her life to sell me $56 worth of flowers that her profit margin was probably $20 on. So the, the energy that she put into it was so much and what she was left over with at the end was virtually nothing at all. In my father's company, people used to do deals when I was the sales manager, people used to do deals for a thousand dollar profit or $1,200 profit. We we're running a big company with a lot of employees. And if every employee was making $1,200 profit per deal, it was not enough to sustain such a big company with such big expenses. So I made a rule. I said to them, from now on, you have to have a profit margin of minimum of $5,000. And everybody complained and everyone was huffing and puffing. How are we going to do that? Eventually, they all started making deals for more than $5,000. And we realized together that the time and energy that it takes to make a $5,000 deal and to make a $500 deal was the exact same amount of time. So whatever it is that you're selling, the juice has to be worth the squeeze. Momentum is also really important in sales. Before I started my business, Wealthy Commercials, one of the things that I had wanted to sell was private jets. I'm passionate about it. The profit margin is high. The problem is when I would speak to private jet salespeople, they said that they had a great year if they sold one or two jets. It's really hard to gain momentum if you are stuck in a sales process that takes so long and that also you can't win every single day or every single week or every single month. Sales becomes an adrenaline. You ever speak to a salesperson, you know when they're having a bad week, but you know when they're having a great week. They're on top of the world. And as a salesperson, you have to chase that feeling, that adrenaline, that high. And the only way that you're going to be able to get that is 
by selling something that you're going to gain momentum with. You want to make sure that you could have sales, if not every day, at least every week, right? So that you could go from win to win. People know when you're winning. People know when you're doing great in your business. People know when you're hot and when you're selling. I remember I was on a sales trip where we hit the road. By the way, in-person meetings are the best way to sell. Everybody's trying to sell through Zoom. Everybody's trying to sell through email. Everybody's trying to sell through the phone. When you can get in front of a client, you win. I went to this, I, I came off of this super hot sales trip where we had went from state to state to meet with potential clients. And we had sold so much in such a short period of time. My last meeting of the sales trip, we got in front of the client, we pitched. I didn't give any discounts. I gave my full price. I gave my full robust package. And they were trying to hammer me on price. They were trying to hammer me on time. They were trying to hammer me on the package. And I just wasn't moving. Why? Because I was on fire from all the sales that I had made that week. And I didn't need the contract, quite frankly. So I was able to stick to my guns. They saw that. They saw that I was confident. They saw that I was strong. And, it, and they gave me exactly what I was asking for. They didn't take $1 off of the product. They didn't take one ounce off of the package. And they took the entire thing. Why? Because I was on fire. You want to have something that you could build momentum with and go from sale to sale because people feel that. People know when you're hot. People know when you're on fire. So make sure whatever it is that you're going to sell, you could sell a lot of it frequently with a high profit margin. What type of clients should you go after? I have a mantra in my business. I like to go towards big clients that have a lot of money. I always use the analogy of a Jenga block. Anybody who's ever played Jenga knows that it's a game that you pull out blocks and whoever pulls out the last block and causes the Jenga structure to fall, that person loses. Whenever I am in a sales process or I'm looking for a client, I want to make sure that my little Jenga piece that I pull out, meaning the cost of my contract or the cost of my project, I want to make sure that that doesn't affect the company and it's not going to cause the whole company to crumble. I want to make sure that whatever I'm charging is inconsequential in compared to the actual budget that that company has to offer. I get people all the time reaching out to me saying, Beryl, could you do this for me? Could you do that for me? I'm a solopreneur. Uh, my budget is limited and it's just not the type of contract that I'm looking for. I like going towards whales, right? There's many types of fish you could catch. You could either catch a minnow or you could catch a whale. So the question is, where do you find the whales? You got to find them in the deep blue ocean. Usually the easier the contract is and the lower the amount is and the smaller the client, the more work you're going to have to put into it because that client is so concerned of every single dollar, they're going to drive you nuts about what you're trying to sell them. They're going to try to reduce it to the lowest package possible versus a client that's very robust doing several million dollars a year. If your package is 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year, a lot of clients won't even feel that. So you want to make sure that the clients you're going after, first of all, have the means to pay you. It's the number one thing that's important. When I get a lead that comes in, from my LinkedIn, for example, the first thing that I'll check is how many people work at that company. This is a great way to determine what their budget is. If you see that there's one person that works at the company and it's them, chances are that they don't have a huge budget. If they have five people or 10 people on their payroll, you know that every two weeks that company has to magically come up with $30,000. If they have a hundred people on their payroll, then they have to come up with millions of dollars a year just to pay those people. So what's your contract going to do to them? They're used to paying, they're used to budgets, they're used to outlaying cash. And that is a good determining factor of if that company has enough money to pay for your contract or not. You always want to go to the decision maker. The best person in the company to pull the trigger, to make the decision to work with you is always going to be the owner because their signature is on the check or their visa is in their wallet. A big mistake that I see is people pitching the secretary, right? When people start making phone calls or cold calling, they're trying to pitch the secretary. The secretary has no interest in bringing you into that company. A lot of times, by the way, 
A lot of times, whoever's working at that company will actually resent the fact that you get the business. Let's say your contract is worth, I don't know, $50,000 and their salary is $36,000. Well, then they're going to resent the fact that you're getting so much money, right? Their brain doesn't think like an owner. An owner's mind is programmed for robustness. An owner's mind is programmed to invest in the company, not looking to penny pinch. I can't tell you how many times I've pitched a company or I've pitched somebody that was not the owner of the company or the president or the CEO. And whoever I was pitching it to started badmouthing their boss to me saying, I gotta tell you, he or she is very cheap. They don't spend money. I think you're wasting your time. I say, thank you very much for your advice. Could I please have the meeting anyways? I set up the meeting with the owner of the company and I leave the meeting with a contract. Why? Because he or she is the decision maker and they ultimately want to invest in their business. Don't waste time with people that cannot give you a yes. Go directly to the top. It's important to own a space. Everybody likes talking to a professional. When you own a particular sector or a particular space and you know it like the back of your hand, you're going to be able to command more money for that contract than a general person. Let's say you're a marketing firm and you specialize in, I don't know, selling, photocopy machines and that's you know that business and you know all the models and you know all the ins and outs and you know the competitors you're going to be able to command a higher price because of your knowledge of that particular industry so whatever it is that you're looking to sell become an expert in that space become the go-to person in that space that you know exactly the ins and outs of that industry and you're going to be able to command a higher price for your services Now we're going to discuss how to generate leads for your product, your service, or your time. There was a point in my company, Wealthy Commercials, that I had everything set up. I had the infrastructure. I had the best talent in the market. I had a great product. The problem was, is I had a lack of leads. A lead is somebody that is qualified to buy your service or your product, and they're able to pay you for that. And you have to have so many leads. You have to fill up your pipeline with so many leads because I'll tell you the average closing ratio is low, right? So if you have a hundred leads, you might only close 10 of them. Hopefully after this program, you're closing more, but you have to stack up your leads with as many possible people as you could possibly imagine. I always say the best negotiation is when your plan B is better than your plan A. Right? So if you have so many leads that you cannot get to that amount of leads, you're able to charge what you feel your product or service is worth. And you're able to command what you want to command in the market because, Hey, if this guy doesn't buy, you have a hundred people lined up right behind him that are possible buyers. So the question now is how do you generate those leads? Let's start with what I like to call your power base. Every person has collected over their lifetime contacts, friends, family, acquaintances, past schoolmates, past employers, past colleagues that they have built a relationship with, not in the business zone, but those people like you, they know you, and they trust you. And that is the first people that you should go to to sell your product. I remember when I opened up Wealthy Commercials, who was the first person that I sold? My father-in-law. Why? Because he likes me, I think, and I hope, and he wants the best for me. And I believed what I had was going to help him. And he bought my first contract and gave me my first start. And now you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't want to sell my family. I don't want to sell my friends. If you don't believe in your product enough to sell it to your family members or your friends, then you shouldn't be selling what you're selling in the first place. Because if you really believe in what you're selling, you're going to want the people that you know to have this product because they can't live one day more on planet Earth without it. So you want to pick up the phone and you want to call those people and say, Hey, Tom, how you doing? Long time, no speak. What are you up to these days? And find out what they're doing and how your product or service can help them in their business or in their career. Remember though, we want to go towards people that have money. You cannot squeeze water from a rock unless you're Moses. So you might have the best relationship with your mailman, but he's not able to buy a $50,000 watch from you because he just doesn't have the money to do it. You want to make sure that when you're reaching out to people, they have the potential to buy from you. So these people like you, they know you and they trust you. Trust is a huge factor when it comes to sales. During the COVID pandemic, I started selling masks. I did very well with it. Thank God. And I realized the people that I was selling to was people that I had already done business with. 
Why? Because the way that that business worked was you had to pay 100% in advance, and once you paid, we shipped the masks. No one's wiring you $100,000 if they don't know who you are, if they don't trust you, if you don't have a track record with them. Everybody that you know is a potential, by the way. Past employers, past colleagues, people that you used to work with, people that you went to school with. Even if it's your high school bully that used to torture you in high school, guess what? If she owns a big business, we want to sell her our product or service. Everybody's on the agenda. They'll pick up your phone calls and they'll meet with you. You want to pick up the phone, you want to say, hey Stacy, how have you been? I haven't spoken to you in a long time. Hey Tom, what's good? You want to go for a coffee, you want to have lunch, and you figure out what angle you can now sell that person. And you're going to see those sales are so much easier than going in cold. Why would you want to start with somebody that doesn't know you, somebody that doesn't trust you, somebody you have no relationship with? Make sure that there's some sort of connection. By the way, even if you have to get introduced, you have your power base, right? Your friends, your family, your acquaintances, your colleagues, but you also have their friends, families, acquaintances, and colleagues. So let's say just this morning, for example, somebody reached out to me. He has a security company. He wants to sell his product to a major real estate developer in Montreal. He knows I'm good friends with that person. So he asked me to make an introduction for him. Why? He's leaning on his power base, which is me. And he's now using my power base to get him one step closer to this person. And this buyer is going to feel a lot more comfortable buying from my friend. Why? Because he knows that he has me in the middle. So if something goes wrong, he has somebody to arbitrate between the both of them and to make sure that everybody's getting a fair deal. You've got to use that power base. You built it this whole time. You didn't even know that it was valuable, but you have to mine that gold that you have sitting right under you. There's a saying that exists, fly under the radar. A lot of people like to do their business quietly. They don't want people to know what they're up to. They want to be very hush-hush about what they're doing. I take the exact opposite approach. I like to fly as high over the radar as I could possibly get. You have to get attention. You have to make noise. If nobody knows you, nobody could flow you, right? If they don't know who you are, then they cannot buy from you. The biggest problem that people face is obscurity. Today, there's so many ways to get your message out there and to make sure that you yourself are getting known in whatever space that you're looking to get into. With social media, you have so many opportunities and so many advantages. One thing that I did when I started my company is I shared the journey of building my business. So if I was having a great day, I'd post about that. If I was having a miserable day, which happens more often than not, I would post about that and share that. And I would bring people along the journey with me so they would know what I was going through and what I was doing. And through this journey, people began to know me. People began to talk about me. You have to accept every speaking engagement that you could get your hands on. You have to be part of every podcast that you could get your hands on. Write as many articles as you could possibly type out to let the world know exactly what it is that you're doing. Now, people are scared. I, I, I love this. When people come up to me with a new idea and I have to sign an NDA before they could talk about it, a non-disclosure agreement. I, I, I signed the NDA, but I think it's ridiculous. Why would you want to hide what it is that you're working on? Today, everything's open. You have the internet today. There's no secrets anymore, right? But if you learn the skill of selling, then you won't be scared of your competitor finding out what it is that you're doing because you are going to be able to blow so far past them. I have competitors in my space, but they don't even come close to us because we know how to sell. So when you know how to sell, you're not scared of people knowing what it is that you're up to, right? So even in my father's business, I remember we had this niche business, which was recycling metal powder. Nobody recycles metal powder. You know, everybody is scared of it. Some cases it's flammable. We figured out how to do it, and when I wanted to go start telling the world about our metal powder recycling capabilities, the vice president of his company at that time said, we should really fly under the radar and not let anybody know what we're doing. If nobody knows what you're doing, then they can't use your services. You have to scream from the rooftops. You gotta let everybody know. When they know what you're up to, they can buy from you. Social media is the biggest gift that was ever given to anybody that is looking to sell any product or service. Today, you have a phone that you're literally able to reach hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people by a very simple video of yourself explaining what it is that you're doing. Every social media channel has value. LinkedIn happens to be my favorite social media channel because people on LinkedIn are looking for products, they're looking for services, they're looking for business. I built my whole business on LinkedIn and I did it by posting what it is that I'm doing 
how I'm doing it, showing my work, showing what it is that I'm able to deliver to the client. You have to make yourself a leader in your space. People have to know when they think of your space, they should think of you. When people think of video production companies, Beryl Solomon's the first thing that comes to mind. Or sales training, I want Beryl Solomon to come to mind. Let's say you sell insurance, you want the second that they say insurance, you're the only guy or the only girl that pops up in their minds. A few companies that did this very well. Look at Xerox, for example. People used to literally say, can you Xerox this, right? It didn't matter if the machine was actually Xerox, people would say, can you Xerox this? Kleenex, you probably didn't even know this, but Kleenex is actually a brand. So when people say, can you pass me a Kleenex? It could be any other brand in the world, but they own their space. You wanna be the go-to person in your space. When anybody thinks about whatever it is that you're looking to sell, cars, jewelry, real estate, you wanna be the go-to person and in their face every single day. Attention is so important. Attention is value. I'd rather have a thousand friends than a thousand dollars. Why? Because I could sell a thousand people stuff that cost two dollars. And now I made much more than the money that I had. The only way to do this is to get attention. People have to know who you are and what you do. And frequency is huge here, by the way. A lot of people think that, oh, I ran one ad or I made one video or I made one post. That is nothing. Cyberspace is so big that you have to be in people's faces every single day. You have to achieve this kind of omnipresence. That when people open up their LinkedIn, boom, you're in their face. When people open up their Facebook, bang, you're right there in front of them. Their Instagram, their YouTube, their WhatsApp statuses. You gotta be constantly in their face because there will come a day that they're gonna need you. They're gonna need your product or service. And when they do, there's only one guy that they've known that's been doing this this whole time and that is you. Flying under the radar is such an old school mentality. People want to know you. Any great company that you've ever heard of, whether it's Apple, whether it's Microsoft or Tesla, they got themselves known and you have to too. And that's gonna help you generate leads. That's gonna help you fill up your pipeline. That's gonna help you grow exponentially because what did we say before? Your best negotiation is when your plan B is better than your plan A. When you have tons of leads, when you have tons of leads to choose from, you're able now to sell more products into the market. You wanna make sure your lead pipeline is smoking hot. It's so hard to get people's attention today. People are bombarded from every single corner, from every single angle. People are getting ads all day, every day. Everybody has a message that they're looking to share today. The more you get your message out there, the more leads you're able to generate. The way that I've been able to generate leads for myself is by breaking societal norms, right? Everybody's playing the safe game. Everybody wants to look professional. And sometimes it's actually the unprofessional thing that's gonna help you get to that next level. I remember I was once trying to sell a lawyer on a marketing contract and I proposed an idea to him. He says, no, 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 we can't do marketing. We can't do videos. We have to respect how lawyers are portrayed. And I have a very, you know, uptight business and white glove and lawyers can't do that. I have a buddy. His name is Jamie Ben Isri. This guy is a lawyer and has the craziest marketing. Guys make, makes videos all day. Guy does podcasts all day. I don't even know if he practices law anymore or he's just such a good marketer and he brings in all these leads from all of his business. So even if you're in a very, white glove industry, even better of an opportunity to break through the noise and to get attention because everybody's playing the safe game. I remember one time I really was having trouble breaking through the noise. Everybody was fresh on LinkedIn. People were posting, you know, videos like it was going out of style when everybody was excited about it, when it really took off and my stuff was not getting any visibility. So I went on top of a car and I started jumping up and down and talking to the camera and the video went viral. You have to break those societal norms and step out of what people have deemed acceptable to get that attention. Remember, when you get attention, people know who you are and they could buy from you. And even if they don't buy from you and they don't reach out to you directly and say, hey, I want to buy your product or service. Well, when you reach out to them and you go make that meeting with them, they're going to know who you are because they saw your marketing online. I can't tell you how powerful it is when I walk into a client's office and I'm meeting with the president or the CEO of that company and he doesn't know who I am. But as I'm walking through, people are leaving their cubicles to take a selfie with me because they saw me online somewhere. And then when I sit down with the guy in his office, he says, wow, I can't believe, how, how do they all know you? 
So it makes an impression on the people, right? And this all comes back to trust. When people see you in their face every day, they get to know who you are, they get to trust who you are, they get to see your struggles, your ups, your downs, your victories, everything. When you go to sell them a product, they're already in your power base. Even if they've never had a personal relationship with you, every time they open up their phone, you're on it. Who are they more likely to give the business to? You or somebody that they never met in their life before? Even if your price is more expensive, they're more likely to give the business to you. Another great source of leads is trade shows. As I mentioned before, face-to-face -face is the most powerful thing when it comes to business. While everybody's trying to sell digitally, when you could actually get in front of somebody, there's nothing more powerful. So we've done business trips where we've booked half a dozen meetings in half a dozen states, and we went from client to client, and when they see that you come to them, they have the chance to meet you in person, they are more likely to buy from you because they don't want to waste your time. Trade shows is an opportunity for you to meet hundreds of people in a very short amount of time. I remember one time I met a guy at a trade show. I was trying to get this guy on the phone for years. Never answered one message, never answered one email, never picked up my phone calls. After I shook his hand at the trade show, he says to me, he says, now that I met you, I'll start answering your phone calls. I ended up doing so much business with this guy. Why? Because I met him in person. When you can meet somebody and they can see that you're a real person and they're a real person, you develop that relationship and you collect those people and push them into your power base. And now you could start selling to them much easier. Trade shows are a phenomenal place to get really great leads and to build that power base. When you go to a trade show, you have to be on beast mode, okay? We've gone to trade shows before where we walked the entire conference or trade show and we clocked how many kilometers we walked at the end of the day. We walked 20 kilometers in one day in one building. You have to be willing to say hello to everybody, shake hands with everybody, give your business card to everybody and collect those contacts and collect those leads. Nobody is coming to you at a conference or a trade show and handing you a signed contract. Anything that I've ever gotten in my life, I had to go out and get, I had to go out and earn. I had to initiate the conversation, initiate the sale, initiate the lead, right? So I see sometimes at conferences, you have these guys that they book these incredible booths, they spend tens of thousands of dollars on these booths and they sit in them and they wait for people to come to them. Nobody's coming to you. I remember one time we went to a conference and we built a very impressive booth. I think we spent $50,000 on it and the rest of the salespeople in the booth were just sitting back waiting for people to come to us. I stood in the aisle and I literally pulled people into our booth to get them to talk to us, to show them what we do, to pitch to them, right? It's all about the pitch. It's all about a numbers game. So at these trade shows and these conferences, you want to add those people to your power base and you want to add as many contacts as you can so that you could have the best chance of selling your product or service. Sometimes I go to meetings, by the way, and sometimes I'm generating leads or having conversations or I'm going on business trips. And my wife says to me, do you really have to go to all those people? And I said, you know what? If you have a hundred seeds in a bag and you plant every single one of them, maybe only 10 are going to grow, but you don't know which 10. That's why you have to load up on leads so you can increase your ratios. I see these guys that they have a product and they, they serve it to one person and they don't know if it's going to work or not. And when they get shut down, they go home and they give up. It's not the way to be. You got to increase your closing ratios. That's another thing that people miss. They think that when they're so busy that they can't handle all the business that they have, they slow down on their prospecting. They slow down on their lead generation because they say, I'm so busy right now, I can't even handle anything else. That is a big mistake that people make. When people are hot, they think that it's always gonna stay hot. Let me tell you something, it will quiet down. And you wanna make sure in those quiet times that you have enough leads that you could fill your pipeline with, that you could go pitch your product to, that you will never have another day where you're sitting around with nobody to sell. Leads are gold ready to be mined. Load up on your leads and get your pipeline screaming hot. Now I would like to discuss pricing and how to price your product or service. A lot of people think that it just comes down to price. It is such a mistake. We spoke about earlier on in this program that you wanna to go towards whales. You wanna find people that have money, that price is not a problem for them. 
I always like to sell things that there's enough meat on the bone that it gets me excited to get out of bed in the morning. If your price is not what you feel in your heart that it's worth, you're going to be less motivated to get that business. You're going to be less motivated to fulfill that contract and you're not going to go the extra mile for your clients. So whatever your pricing is, you have to make sure that there's meat on the bone that you are excited about it. Now I want to discuss pricing which is probably one of the most important things that you have to figure out in your whole sales process. I personally like to sell things that have big price tags. Why? Because the upside is big and you should be charging what you feel comfortable with that you're happy to take on that contract. Because if you're devaluing your price, if you're just trying to, you know, get the contract and give up price and just go for the cheapest option all the time, you're not going to feel good about the contract that you are getting yourself into. You have to have something that gets you excited to get out of bed in the morning. So when you are charging the price that you feel is the right price for your product or service, you're going to be excited to fulfill that contract. If the client asks you for something extra, you're not going to feel like you already gave them such a good deal. Why should you do this? No, you have meat on the bone. So you're going to feel great about giving him extra service because it's already worked into your pricing. Pricing is a sensitive thing. Everybody wants to go towards the lowest price. Let me tell you, when you have a great product or service, and when you know how to sell, most importantly, price is not a factor. You want to go towards people that could afford your product or service, right? So you want to go towards wealthier people that have the means to pay the right price. You cannot have great service and a cheap price. You cannot have a phenomenal product and experience and have a cheap price. You should not go for being the cheapest person in the market because you are going to have to cut a corner. And usually the corner that's going to have to get cut is the client's corner. Stay strong on your pricing and charge what you feel you deserve for that work. It all goes back to as much leads as you have. When you have leads in your pipeline, when you have so many people that you could do business with, you don't have to be the lowest cost provider in the market. If you only have a few potential clients that you could go to, you have to be lowest cost provider because you have no choice and you have to bring revenue in so you could feed your family that week. So here's a few techniques to make sure that you're getting paid what you deserve on the deal. You want to go in, first of all, not with your lowest price. You want to make sure that you have some room to move because people feel like they always want to get a deal and everybody wants to negotiate. A lot of times when I'm going into a negotiation, I'll actually give an inflated price. So let's say, for example, I feel that my services are worth $20,000. On the contract or when I'm talking to the prospect, I'll tell them that, you know what, this is actually a $30,000 deal but we're running a special this month. We're actually running a 33% discount. And instead of $30,000 in the month of June, we're gonna give you a deal and we're gonna do it for $20,000. That's an example. I'll give you another one. Let's say again, I wanna be left with $20,000 at the end. Hey, Mr. Buyer, usually this package costs $30,000, but because I see that there's so much potential to do business with you and your company, I'm willing to bring my pricing down to $20,000 in order that if we do a great job, I could have the opportunity to earn more of your business. That's another way to do it. Let me give you another one. Hey, Mrs. Buyer, usually what we charge on these contracts is $30,000. But if you give me two contracts, what I'll do for you is, I'll actually bring my pricing per contract down to $20,000 each. So that since we're doing a bulk deal, I'm able to give you a much better deal. Can we do this? Right, so that's another example of how to go in with a higher price and do the negotiation for the buyer themselves. At least they feel like they're getting a deal. Here's another way to not give up your pricing. You want to do a deal for $20,000 and you know if they pay you $19,000, you're not going to be so excited to do the deal and you're not going to give it your all. So you say to them, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, what I would like to propose is instead of lowering my cost to $19,000, which doesn't really bring value to you or to me, and we're gonna to have to cut a corner somewhere, and I'd rather not cut corners, let me add something to the package. So you add a free training, or you add a warranty, or you add something extra, at least they feel that they did their job in the negotiation. I remember one time I was sitting with a client, I was selling them a product, I was selling them 100,000 units of something, and our pricing was $3 a unit. 
So they said, ah, could you go down in pricing and you know, it's very expensive and I, you know, you have to do something better on the pricing for us. I said, no, this is what it is. This is what the project costs. This is what the material is. And I need $3 a unit. So they said to me, you have to do something. It's my job. The buyer at the company was literally saying, it's my job to do this. So I said, okay, no problem. I'll give you a half a penny off. She said, okay, thank you so much. Done deal. She felt so good about herself that she got a little bit of a discount and she was able to then give it to the boss and say, hey, look, I did my job. So you always want to make sure that in your original price, you have room to move, right? You have room to come down, but do that negotiation for the client themselves. Another way to not give up on pricing is to offer different packages. Let's say you're quoting on a home renovation for somebody's kitchen and you come in and your pricing is $75,000 to do the job and you put it on the contract and you pass it over to the buyer and you say, this is what the price is going to be. And they start saying to you, well, you know, it's very expensive and it's very this and it's very that. And you say, okay, well, hey, I can lower my pricing. Let's take off the marble countertops. Let's choose the cheaper tile. Let's choose a oven or whatever it is that is of a lesser quality. And you actually make the package smaller by five or $10,000. And you say to them, listen, my opinion though, I have to tell you is that we actually go with what you want. You're going to have this kitchen for the next 40 years of your life. You want to make sure every time you go into that kitchen that you are able to feel good about yourself. You're able to enjoy your kitchen. Take that extra $10,000, spread that over 40 years. I mean, we're talking an extra 400 bucks a year. We're talking about $1.25 a day, right? Don't cheap out on this. Get what you want. Buy it right the first time so you could go and enjoy it the rest of your life. That's another example on how to not give up on pricing. Here's another option that you have. A lot of people want to move down in their pricing, right? They want to always offer the cheaper price, right? So you come to the buyer, you give your pricing, the buyer has a mini heart attack and does their whole song and dance and it's too expensive. You say, I'll tell you what, Mr. Buyer, we have another package that's actually three times as expensive. It's $60,000, but it includes X, Y, Z. Then they say, wow, you know what, maybe I'll stick with my $20,000 package. I actually feel like I'm, I'm getting a deal right now, right? So you want to be able to move the buyer up and down a sliding scale and make different packages for them so they have options. But you always want to hit your sweet spot on the package that you know you're making the maximum amount of money with the least amount of effort so that you could go on to your next contract. Pricing is an art that you're going to master. I would like to now discuss how a salesperson should look, how they should sound, how they should feel, what vibe they're coming off with. So a salesperson's life is really miserable, I have to tell you. There's no other profession in the world that I know that people are saying no to you multiple times a day and you're getting shut down constantly. And it's so easy to get discouraged when you're a salesperson because you're constantly hearing the word, no, I can't, not now. You know, a secretary doesn't have to go through that. An accountant does not have to endure that misery, but you as a salesperson will have to endure that. You have to develop a thick skin. A salesperson should always be the best dressed person in that room. Nobody wants to do business with a slob. They want to know that they're doing business with you because you're sharp, you get it, you're with it. I was in a meeting this week that I got a contract, I was twice the price of what I was quoting on, but the buyer literally told me, I'll tell you what, I like you. I happen to actually really like your jacket and I think you're the right guy to work with. He really told me this. You should be the best dressed person in that room. When you walk in that room, people should know that you're there, right? A salesperson is not looking to fly under the radar. Nobody is going to sell to you if they don't know who you are. You have to make yourself known. You have to have a positive energy. You have to put a big smile on your face. The buyer tells you no. You got to put a smile back on your face fast and you got to get back on your feet and you got to figure out another angle. It's all about your tone. It's all about how you feel. It's all about how you look. It's all about how are you making the buyer feel across from you? Did they see that they were able to get under your skin? Did they see that saying no made you actually give up on your product or service? Because if you don't believe in what you're doing, how are they supposed to believe in what it is that you're doing? I read a book one time by Dale Carnegie called How to Make Friends and Influence People. Brilliant book, I suggest you read it. One of the suggestions he gives in there is actually to record yourself. People don't even know what they sound like. You ever record yourself and say, "Ugh, I hate the way that I sound. So he suggests in the book to record yourself doing a greeting or doing a pitch. 
and the tone of voice is actually everything. Let me give you an example. You walk into a room, you walk into your office, you walk into your client and you say, good morning. Now you want to have that upbeat pitch. You could say the same good morning, but you could say good morning. One says, I'm open to do business, I'm here to serve, I'm happy to help, yes sir, yes miss, anything you need. And the other one says, good morning, meaning I'm not really happy with my life right now, I'm not happy to be here. People want to deal with people that are infectious. People want to deal with happy people. Most people in business are miserable. They go to their job, they drudge through the day, and they go home and they turn on Netflix, and they drown out their sorrows in some social media vice that they use. People are miserable. People want to do business with people that are uplifting, that are positive, that are fun, that are infectious. And you want to be that person. You got to dress well, you got to look sharp, you got to sound good, and you got to have a demeanor that makes people say, wow, how do I get this person around me more? You have to have an attitude in sales that yes, I am ready to serve. When your buyer, your client says jump, you want to say, how high. The business arena is difficult. People in general to work with are difficult. But you got to let your buyer know that you're willing to do anything to earn his business and you're the right person to work with. So when you run into a hard situation, you're going to have the same smile on your face and you're going to be ready to serve them with a can-do attitude. Nobody wants to do business with people that nickel and dime them. Nobody wants to do business with people that they have to beg to get that work done. I've had people that have worked for me. I've hired people in the past for different contracts that I needed for myself or my company and I'll never work with them again because they're miserable to deal with. Everything you ask them, they make you feel as if They are doing you a favor. When somebody gives you a contract, when somebody gives you business, when somebody gives you a deal, they're doing you the favor. And you gotta treat them like that the whole way through. Be that person that everybody wants to be friends with. A salesperson has to be so confident in what it is that they're selling. If you are not confident in your product or service, people will smell that right away. And people will not buy from you. Because if you're not confident, then how are they supposed to be confident? I remember one time I went to go buy a car. I went to go buy a minivan for my wife. We're at the Honda dealership. And I asked the salesperson, what type of car do you drive? He said, I drive an Acura. I said, you don't drive a Honda? He said, nah, I really like the Acura. I said to him, so how am I supposed to buy the Honda from you if you don't even believe in your product? So you have to sell yourself on your own product. You have to be very confident in what it is that you are pushing into the market. You have to buy your own product, essentially. Right? If you're not willing to buy your product, then nobody is going to be willing to buy from you. Now, there's days that this is very difficult because the whole world has told you that they're not willing to buy your product or service. And now you feel like maybe it's not a good product or service. In those moments, what you have to do is, and actually do this, is write down on a piece of paper with a pencil or on your phone, and you have to resell yourself on your own product or service. You have to write down all the benefits. My Watches are the best watches because they're handmade, because it's real silver, because they will never lose track of time. Whatever, they look great, best style in the market. You have to get yourself revved up about what it is that you're selling. If you wash windows, for example, you have a window washing company, you have to sell yourself why you're the best window washer on planet Earth, right? You have to write down, I never leave a mark. My guys are always on time. We never miss a deadline. We use the best products in the market. We don't skimp on what it is that we do. Our clients love us. You got to get yourself jacked up about what it is that you're selling because people feel that. People know when you're sold on what it is that you're looking to sell. When you're sold yourself, you're able to sell other people. The first sale that you have to make, even before you're selling the buyer, the first sale that you have to make is yourself. When you are sold, you're able to sell other people. When they say no to you, to whatever it is that you're looking to sell them, you're shocked. You're like, how could this person not buy this right now? The price is right, I'm the right person to sell it, the product is the right product, how could they not do it? You have to literally get to a point where you are shocked that this person is not buying your product. I've walked out of so many meetings that I didn't sell what I was looking to sell and I felt bad for the prospect. I felt bad for them that I didn't do my job properly, that they didn't leave with my product in hand. I really felt bad about it. You have to get to a point where you literally feel bad and guilty at the fact that you didn't do your job as a salesperson to make sure that your prospect left with your product because they cannot live one extra day without whatever it is that you're looking to sell. 
Be confident in what it is that you're selling and make everybody fall in love with your products and you. I would like to now discuss meetings. Every sale that has ever happened on planet Earth, except for e-commerce, has always started and ended with a meeting. It is the arena in which you will play your sport. It is the stage in which you will dance your ballet. It is where the magic happens. Most people don't know how to get meetings. So let's start from the beginning. Let's start with the lead. The lead has come in, you got it from your power base, or you got it from social media, or you got it from your LinkedIn. Now you have to set up a meeting with the client. Here's some of my favorite tips, tricks, and tools to get that meeting done. So I usually say to the prospective buyer, I usually say something like, hey, so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for liking my post, or thank you so much for taking the phone call with me or, hey Jack, I would love to set up a meeting with you to discuss X, Y, Z. And the immediate reaction to people and meetings is, people don't like meetings. They think they're a waste of time, they have a stigma. For sure, if they know you're a salesperson, they think that meeting with you is gonna cost them money. Or people also think that they're really busy, right? In everybody's mind, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, they don't think they have the time. So here are some of my favorite tips and tricks to get meetings with people. So let's say, they saw a social media post that I made on LinkedIn about a new product or service that I'm now launching into the market and they liked my post. I'll send them a private message on LinkedIn, something like, hey Stephanie, thank you so much for liking my post, really appreciate it. Let's try hopping on a call sometime next week. When Stephanie replies, yeah, I would love to, right? Because it's non-committal, it's not this week, it's not getting in the middle of their plans. Nobody's doing anything sometime next week. You propose a time. How does two o'clock on Tuesday sound? And they're gonna say, ah, I don't know, I, I have a meeting or I'm booked on Tuesday, I'm very busy on Tuesday. Great, how does Wednesday at 10 o'clock sound? They're gonna say, oh, you know, I'm not sure my schedule changes. You say to them like this, no problem, Stephanie. I'm okay with that. Let's just book the meeting anyways. If you have to move it, you move it. And they say, okay, sure, no problem. It, right, it's non-committal. People don't like to make commitments today. So now we're booked up for Wednesday at 10 o'clock. You ask for their cell phone number and their email address, and you send them a calendar invite. So it blocks off the time on their calendar. It also blocks off the time on your calendar, and you can now load up that calendar invite. You could do this on Outlook or on Google. You load it up with reminders. You remind them 10 minutes before the meeting, 30 minutes before, an hour before, a day before, and two days before. So they're constantly getting reminders, whether it's by email or by push notifications on their phone, that they have a meeting with you. So now let's say you're trying to get a meeting with a person and they're just not getting back to you. They're dodging your calls, they're not answering your messages. You have to break through the noise, right? It may not be you and it may not be your product or service that they don't want. It might be that they have a lot of bombarding from every direction, right? We have been going towards people that have money. Usually people that have money are bombarded from every direction for people trying to sell them things. So you have to somehow break through the noise. So something that I love to do that breaks through the noise and gets the attention of the buyer that I'm trying to sell to is I'll take out my phone, just like this, and I'll record a video for him or her and send it to them by WhatsApp or by text message or iMessage or whatever it is that I'm communicating to them with. Even on LinkedIn today, you could send a video. So it'll go something like this. Hey Stephanie, hey Jack, how you doing? I hope you're having a great day. Beryl Solomon here, we spoke briefly on LinkedIn. I would love to hop on a call with you next week to show you what we're doing in your space. I think that we could really help you. The meeting will be very quick, don't worry about it. I only need 15 minutes of your time. Please let me know what is a good time and I will clear my schedule to make sure that it works for you. Can't wait to meet with you, thank you so much. Right, and I'll take that and I'll text message it to the guy, or I'll send the girl a WhatsApp, or I'll send it to them on Instagram, or LinkedIn, or whatever it is that I'm communicating with them to break through the noise. So now let's say that you've got the prospect, you have the lead, you've pitched them, you've tried to set up a call with them, you've sent them video messages yourself, and still radio silence, what do you do? There's only one thing to do at that point, you show up at their office. I can't tell you how many contracts and how many deals that I've made by just showing up at somebody's office. 
And you might say, well, isn't that a little unprofessional? Yes, it's very unprofessional. I'm not looking to be professional here. I'm looking to make a sale, right? And that's what you have to do to break through the noise. When you show up at a person's office, guaranteed, 1,000 out of 1,000 times, if they're there, they will give you the time of day. And by the way, even if it's only to come out to say hello to you in the lobby, well, guess what? They saw your face, you had a chance to shake a hand, and you have a chance at that moment, they may come out to you and say, hey, you know, now is really not a good time, so nice to see you. You say, no problem, sir. Can I come back tomorrow at the same time? Does that work for you? Ah, I'm so busy, I can't, I won't, I, I, you know, I have so many things going on, no problem. What about next week at the same time on Tuesday? Does that work for you? Ah, call me then. No problem, I'll call you then, but if I don't call and you don't answer, I'm letting you know, I'm showing up. Let them know that they're not getting rid of you, that they're gonna have to give you that meeting. Here's another thing that may happen to you. The person tells you, ah, no problem, I'll give you a meeting in Q4 of next year. Nobody is meeting with you in Q4 of next year. That's their way of saying, I'm not interested, I'm too busy, please leave me alone. What you have to do at that point is you say, sir or miss, I only need four minutes of your time. Please give me that four minutes, and if you don't like what I have to say out of that four minutes, I will walk myself out of your office, or I will hang up on myself. Can I get four minutes of your time? Everybody has four minutes. People may not want to meet with you because they're overwhelmed. They don't want to sit through another boring presentation. People are very selfish when it comes to meetings. You book a meeting with a person and they sit in your office for two hours. Who wants that? Let the person know, I'm quick, I'm efficient, I mean business. If it's a yes, great. If it's a no, I still love you. Give me four minutes, it's all I need. You want to have as many meetings person to person as you could possibly have. And you're going to see that usually the buyer is gonna to try to discourage you from coming to their office. Why? Because they know that if you're making the commitment to come see them, they don't wanna waste your time and they don't wanna waste your investment of your energy to get them as a client if they're not gonna buy from you anyways. So they're gonna say, oh no, a phone meeting is okay or send me an email. Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, I'm in your area anyways next week. I would love to come swing by. I love the area, I've been meeting to get out there. Just give me four minutes of your time, that's all that I need. I hopped on planes before to go meet with the person and say to them, I'm gonna meet with you for four minutes and I'm gonna fly to come meet you just because you're worth it. And they're gonna feel so touched, so honored that you took the time to go meet with them. The best, juiciest contracts and the easiest sales is when I go on the road and when I go travel to different parts of the country. When a person sees that I hopped on a plane to go meet with them, they do not wanna waste my time and they don't wanna let me leave empty-handed. Just as much as I wanna sell, they wanna buy so they can justify the fact that I went to go meet with them. So you're never wasting your time to go meet with people. You're never wasting your time to go hop on a flight. People really appreciate when you go meet with them in person. Nine times out of 10, when I go meet with a client in their office and I flew there or I drove six hours, whatever it is to go meet with them, I'm leaving with a signed contract in my hand because we both know that there was a set time for this meeting. We both know that both of our time is precious. We both know that most likely I'm not coming back. So they wanna make sure that they utilize their time with me and they sign the contract right then and there so we could commence our work. Let's talk about pitching your product. So you got the lead, you got the meeting, you're sitting in the person's office or you're sitting on the phone with them. Now it's time finally to pitch your product or service. How do you do it? First of all, you wanna make sure that your pitch is tight, right? You wanna make sure that there is no room in your pitch for doubt, error, you don't wanna stumble, you wanna have your thing so rock solid that it makes so much sense to the buyer by the time you're done speaking. A great way to get this down packed is to actually practice your pitch. So I've had salesmen before in the past that have worked for me and I've actually helped them practice their pitch, right? We spoke about recording how you sound. Record yourself in a video camera pitching your product. Grab one of the other salespeople that you work with or even do it with your wife and practice your pitch. Pitch to them why they need your service, what it is that you're able to do for them, why they cannot live one day without your product that you're trying to sell them. Make sure it's tight. You wanna make sure also that your pitch is accompanied by some sort of material, right? So my personal favorite, I happen to own a video production company that puts pitches for people into video form. You wanna show them something in that pitch, right? So my personal favorite is doing the video. Let's say I'm trying to pitch a piece of real estate. I wanna make sure that when I'm sitting with that buyer in his office, 
that I have a video that shows all the facets of that real estate, why it's great, what advantages they are, aerial drone shots. I want to make sure that I have something that they're able to see that's tangible. Let's say you're selling a piece of machinery, right? You're selling a gigantic dump truck. You're not bringing that dump truck with you to the meeting, although if you could, I would actually drive up to the meeting in the dump truck. But let's say you're trying to sell a $150,000 dump truck. You want to have a piece of marketing material that supports what it is that you're trying to sell. You want to have a video of that thing doing crazy stuff, lifting crazy amounts of weight. You want to have a video that's so rocking of that piece of machinery that you're looking to sell that it just brings the person in. It sucks them in. Let's say you're an accounting firm right? Accounting is something that's so dry. It's so boring. Sorry to all my accountant friends, but you guys also have to sell your product or service. I would have a video that shows our offices, interviews the top accountants at the firm and shows what it is and what we're about to impress your buyer. Here's at what time to bring the video, let's say into the sales process. A lot of times before I even start the meeting, let's say I'm on the phone with the buyer, right? I booked my meeting, right? We had our time on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. I say, hey, Mr. Buyer, are you in front of your computer by any chance? They say, yes. I say, great, I'm going to send you a quick YouTube link. Let me shoot it over to you. Bang, they get it, they open it. Let's watch that. It's a 59 second clip. Before we get started, I think it'll give a good backdrop for what we're going to discuss. If you're an accounting firm, it's going to show how beautiful your office is, maybe an interview or two with some of your top accounting executives. And also it should speak about the products and services that your firm offers. By the time they stop watching that video, they know who you are and what it is that you do. So you can now start your conversation in a real sales arrangement that they're not guessing if you're a real firm, they're not guessing if you're big, if you're small, what you do, what you don't do. Let the video do the pitch for you. That way, when you come out of the video, it sets the backdrop for the entire conversation. Let's say you don't have a video for whatever reason. I think you're crazy if you don't. If you need help, I know a great company that could help you. You have to have something in your hands, right? You have to have a PDF. You have to have a brochure. You have to have something physical that the buyer can actually look at, feel, and touch. When you're talking about ideas, it's hard to bring that into reality. When you put that in front of them, when you put your pricing down, your products down, your packages down, and you have that in one place that the buyer can take a look at and you hand that to the buyer, they're able to see that, wow, this is actually a tangible arrangement that I'm entering into. It's not just somewhere out in space. You wanna have some sort of marketing materials that you're walking into that meeting with or you're on that phone call with that you could send to that buyer that they could see that you're a real company and you are the real deal. You want to make sure that pricing also is directly connected to your pitch, right? A lot of people wait to give pricing at the end. The problem is, is they've made this whole balloon image or dream or whatever it is that they're going to sell you. And it gets deflated when you give pricing because price makes people back off. So the pitch should look something like this. So here's what a pitch should look like and how pricing should come right after the pitch. So you say to the buyer something like this, hey, Mr. Buyer, thank you so much for taking my call today. Thank you so much for accepting my meeting today. So nice to be here. I gotta tell you, I'm really excited about this contract because we really know your space. We know the healthcare space so well. We've helped so many healthcare companies just like yours save so much money when it comes to outsourcing their everyday tasks to our professionals in India that do this every single day. We know your business, we know your industry, we know exactly what you need, we do this all the time. At the end of your pitch, you wanna give them a question, something like this. May I share with you pricing? They're gonna say, sure. Everybody likes to hear pricing. They wanna know what you're charging. Once they say, yes, I wanna hear your pricing, it's almost like a buying question, right? You're asking permission to give pricing. Now, at this point, they might say to you, you know, I'm really not interested, thank you so much, click. Or they might say, sure, nine times out of 10, they're gonna say, sure, you could share with me any pricing you want. So you say to them like this, if you hire one employee per year, it's gonna cost you $1,000 per month. Now, if you go to 10 employees or more, it's gonna cost you $800 per month. And if you wanna go all the way up to 50 employees, it's gonna cost you $500 per month per employee. Right, so this comes right after the pitch. You don't wanna leave that to the end. You might get to the point in your sales process where they're so enamored with your service, with your technology, with your product, and then you wait to the very end of the meeting to share with them pricing and it completely deflates the whole room. 
right? Because they thought that it was going to cost X. You tell them it cost Y and you just lost the sale. At least when you get the pricing out of the way at the beginning, you're able to then move on to other challenges that they have and figure out how to solve those challenges. A great example of this, by the way, is Ikea. If you've ever shopped in Ikea, you know that they put their pricing in gigantic. Let's say the thing is $109.99. They have that posted in like giant letters. The bigger the pricing, the more of a deal that I'm getting. Because I'm saying if they're advertising their pricing that hard, it must be an aggressive pricing. Versus when I go into like a suit shop and there's no pricing anywhere, and I have to either look inside the tag and pull out the thing to see how much it costs, or even worse, I have to ask the person at the front desk how much it costs. I know for sure I'm getting an expensive suit because they're trying to be sneaky and try to hide the price. Don't be shy of your pricing. Get it out as soon as you can in your meeting. So now you're at the end of your pitch, you've done your song and dance, you've supported it with video or some sort of other handheld materials, and you convinced them that you're the best and you told them that you're the greatest and why you're the person for the job. And let's say you're pitching air conditioners. We know air conditioning better than anybody else. We've done other people in your neighborhood that have experience with your house. This air conditioning system is the best system that you could buy for the money. And the price, by the way, is $15,000, right? You want to say the pricing, by the way, you want to say that as if it's like, and pass me the ketchup, $15,000. You want to, you don't want to say it's $15,000. Right? You want to be happy about it. You want to make it like it's not a big deal as if it's like in passing. Yeah, it's 15 grand. Everybody could afford it. So could you, right? So after you give them this pricing, you want to be absolutely quiet. It's going to go something like this. And the pricing is $15,000 and you be quiet. You let them answer you. And it's going to be like four or five seconds of the most excruciating four to five seconds of your life. It's going to be like four to five minutes but you want to allow them a chance to answer you because you want to gauge what their reaction is. So you're going to get a few reactions. One is they're going to say, oh, not as bad as I thought it was. Or they're going to say, whoa, that's expensive. Or they're going to say, okay. Or something like, hmm, that's all you're going to get. So after they've given you this reaction of, okay, or hmm, or dead silence, now is your opportunity to sort of fine tune the package that they need. Maybe the package that you're on is not exactly what it is that they're looking for. Maybe they need something a little more robust. Maybe they need something a little more minimalistic. At that point, you want to ask them another question, something like, so what did you think of the product? And they're going to say, well, I really like it. Great. How do we get started? Or they're going to say something like, nah, I don't think this is for us. Great, that's what I probably thought also. I just wanted to show you this product. Here's another product that we have, very similar, a little bit more expensive, but I think it's the right match for you. You wanna get their reaction from them after you've done your pitch and your pricing, and now you wanna fine tune your offering to make sure it's exactly what it is that they need and what they're looking for. Now I wanna talk about what I like to call assuming the close. People do not like to make decisions. They just don't, for whatever reason. And people in general don't really trust themselves, especially when it comes to spending money. So you want to assume the close for them. You want to assume that your package was great. You want to assume that your pricing was right. And now you want to get them to a point where you're assuming that we're doing this, right? So when can we start to work on your new kitchen? You know, I have some availability in the next two weeks. Does that work for you? They didn't even argue with you on pricing yet. They didn't tell you it was the right package, but you want to start, you want to take that next step. Here's another example of assuming the close. You gave your pitch, you gave your price, they're either gonna say to you, yeah, yeah, we need this yesterday, or oh, I'm not in such a rush, right? But you wanna at least get them in the mind frame that we're doing this deal together, it's just a matter of when. Here's another example of assuming the close. You wanna say something to them like, where would you like me to make the invoice to? Should this be to your company, or are you gonna pay for this personally? They're gonna say my company, great, A1 resources, the address is the same one that we're at right now, and you start writing that down right there on the contract itself. Another great way to ease yourself into the close is a question like, have you heard enough information? Are you ready to make a decision? There's only two answers, either yes or no. So if they say yes, great. You stop talking, you start writing up the contract, you pass it over to them to sign. They might say something to you like, no, I haven't heard enough information. Please tell me a little bit more about X. So then you could elaborate on that thing that they're stuck on, right? So you want to always inch your way into the close and you want to start assuming that they're doing the business with you.
So now you've done your song and dance, you pitched your product, you gave your pricing, you guys negotiated on exactly what they want more of, what they want less of. Now it's time to sign the contract. You cannot sign a contract, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't walk into the meeting with a contract. I walk into every single meeting holding a blank contract. Usually what I like to do is I have an inflated price on the contract, something crazy, three, four times that I'm looking to charge. I'll put a hundred grand on the contract. And as I'm going through the deal with them, I'm adding all the things that they're asking for in the contract itself. And by the end of it, I will cross out the hundred thousand dollars and show them, Hey, it only costs you $20,000 in the end. So at the end of the negotiation, I'll say to them something like this. Are we ready to make a deal? Are we ready to go? Or they'll ask for one last thing. So they'll say, I, I really like it, but can you do this for us as well? I say to them something like this. Absolutely, we'll do that for you. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put in the contract free of charge. I write it down and I pass them the pen. I push them the contract. I look them right in the eye and I make them sign. And it is so awkward, by the way. When you pass that pen, people aren't used to this, by the way. People are used to not making decisions. They're used to salespeople that don't know how to close. They're not even going to do know what to do with the pen. And they're going to take the contract. They're going to say, well, I never sign a contract without reviewing it first. You say to them, hey, it's not a complicated contract. It's two pages long. Would you like to go through it with me together? And you go through point by point. And you pass in the pen. And you stop talking. And you wait till they sign it. They'll say something to you like this. Leave it with me, I'll take a look at it, and I'll sign it tomorrow morning. You say, no, 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 let's do it now. Let's not wait until tomorrow morning. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? We're here, we have the right product, the right pricing, the right package. Let's do this. And you pass them the pen, and you slide them the contract, and you be quiet. Don't back away from that situation, right? Nothing happens until that contract is signed. You do not want to get up from that position until you have signed that contract. Contracts, by the way, are signed sitting down. You never want to get up until that contract is signed. Never get up from the table. Even if the buyer, I was in a situation this week where the buyer was at the table. We had gone back and forth for an hour. I gave him everything that he asked for. I gave him the pricing he asked for, the terms he asked for, everything. And at the end he gets up and he starts holding his head and he starts looking at his phone and he starts getting all nervous about it. I'm sitting down at the table, cool as a cucumber. Deals are made sitting down. Do not get up until that contract is signed. Congratulations, Mazel Tov. You have a signed contract. Now is the moment of truth. You need to get paid for what it is that you're selling. My personal favorite way of accepting payment is credit card. I am in control. I could charge it. I don't have to chase anybody. It's easy. I like it so much, I'll usually tell clients, we actually offer a 1% discount for using credit card. And they'll say to me, wow, you give a 1% discount? Usually people charge us 3% to use a credit card. I say, yeah, you know what? It's so much easier for me. It's so much easier for you. Your accounting people don't have to chase me. I don't have to chase them. What would you like to use? American Express, Visa, or MasterCard? And they're gonna say, American Express. And then I say, great, does it start with a three? Every American Express starts with a three. They're gonna say, yeah, and I start writing three. And I will not stop until I have the digits of that credit card on my piece of paper, wherever I'm taking down those notes. They say a visa starts with a four. Great, what's the number? And I will not stop. And they say, oh, my credit card's in my cart. Great, sir, I'll wait here while you get it, right? Do not leave that meeting without some form of payment. So you got your lead, you booked your meeting, you pitched your product, you gave pricing, you fine tuned the offering in the package, you got a signed contract, and you have a Visa card number in your hands. Time to charge it, congratulations. So now I wanna talk about the follow-up. You've spent so much time, energy, and money acquiring the leads. Let's say for whatever reason, you had your 15, 20, 30 minute meeting with them and they decided that it's not the right time for them for whatever reason to buy your product or service. Say to them something like this, no problem, totally understand, I agree with you. Is it okay with you if I follow up with you in a month from now? Everybody's gonna say yes. Great, I'm gonna send you a calendar invite for same day, same time in four weeks from now, that's okay? 
they're going to say no problem. You send it right then and there. At least you have a touch point with them so you know that you're going to be in front of them again in a month. And you just keep on doing that and just keep on recycling that lead until they're either going to buy from you or block your phone number. Here's another technique that I use very often. Let's say you had a great introductory phone call with somebody. They loved your product, they loved your pricing, they loved your package, but they have to talk internally about it or they have to think about how they're going to implement this in their life or in their business or in their company. You say to them something like this, I know you're very busy, I don't want to bother you, when would be a good time to follow up with you? Can we do maybe same time next week? Nine out of ten times, they're going to say yes, nobody's doing anything at the same time next week. So you take their email, you put it into your calendar invite, you send them an invite, you load them up with reminders, and you set that touch point for the same time next week. It's very rare that you're gonna get a deal on your first phone call. People like to be coddled, and people like to know that you're gonna stay on them and be persistent. So never, ever end any sales arrangement, whether it's a phone call or a meeting, without another touch base and another follow-up where you're gonna come in and have them on the phone again. And they might say to you, by the way, you know what, I'm not sure about next week, I'm not sure what my schedule is. And you bust out to them and say something like, no problem, let's just get it on the board at the same time next week. If you have to move it, you move it. No problem, I won't be upset. So you want to always make sure that you have another touch point with them to follow up so you could go in, swoop in, and close the deal. So for whatever reason, let's say your buyer didn't buy from you. At that point, you never know what's going on in the, in the person's life. You never know what's going on in their business. Just because they said no then does not mean that they're going to say no now. So even if somebody's already shut you down, you still want to get another meeting with them and you still want to repitch them. So maybe they absolutely said no to your product. Maybe your pricing was completely out of this world that they could never fathom them doing something like that or spending that much money. On your next meeting with them, you want to repackage your product. Maybe it's something more robust, or maybe it's something more minimalistic. Maybe it's a new product. You want to use that lead, you want to maximize it to repackage your offering for them and make it something more palatable. You learn things every day. Your product changes every day. The market changes every day. So you want to get another meeting with them to show them your new incredible offering. Another form of following up is with a client they already sold something to. The easiest money is second money. The easiest person to sell is somebody you already sold. People are creatures of habit. They want to do business with people that they've done business with in the past. Just because you sold a guy something a year ago doesn't mean they're not going to buy the same exact thing from you this year. Everybody needs new suits. Everybody needs new marketing. Everybody needs new software updates. They will make the decision to buy with you because they've bought with you in the past and it's familiar and they like it. Second money is the easiest money to get and you want to maximize and make sure that you're selling to your previous clients everything that you can get. During the COVID pandemic, I have a lot of clients in the nursing home business. I sold a lot of masks and a lot of gowns to the same people that I've sold marketing packages to in the past. Why? Because they know me, they trust me, they had a great relationship with me, and they know that when Beryl Solomon says he's going to do something, he delivers. Don't look over the second money, people. Make sure you're maximizing your current customer base. One of the reasons why people don't like to buy is they don't want to take a risk. If you look online, one of the ways that online marketers or e-commerce stores have gotten around this is with a money back guarantee. You don't like your pair of shoes, didn't fit you right, no problem. You can return it in 30 days free of charge. You have to figure out in your business how you could apply this to your sales process. Somebody once sold me a consulting package where they came to my company once a month for a full 12 year period and they helped us refine our company, maximize our profits. And at the end of his whole pitch, his song and dance, his price, I was a little hesitant to sign the contract. It was for a lot of money. He said to me, if I don't bring the value that I'm charging to you, I will return every penny to you free of charge. And I said, wow, no risk, of course. And I signed the contract. You have to figure out what your angle is, what your free of charge angle is. Now, it's hard if you're a construction company building something for somebody 
after it's done, you kind of have to. But there's so many cases. If you're a marketing company, for example, you say to them, if I don't bring to you at least twice the value that you're paying me, I'll return all your money free of charge. Or if you're a law firm, if we don't win this case, we don't get paid. There's a lot of law firms that work on that basis. You say to them, if your piece of machinery is not exactly what you would like it to be, we'll take back the piece of machinery in the first 30 days, no questions asked, right? You wanna take away the risk from people so that they can make the decision. Nobody likes risk, you don't, I don't, so why should your client? If you're not willing to give a money back guarantee and stand behind your product, then why should they buy it? You have to believe in what it is that you're selling. When they see that you're so confident in what it is that you're selling to them and how it's gonna change their life, they're gonna like that, they're gonna believe in you. I've offered this money back guarantee hundreds of times, never came back once. By the way, and even if it did, on the 99 times that it worked, it's worth it. Money back guarantees, take the risk out of it for your clients. So in this portion of the program, we're gonna teach you how to handle objections from the client. A lot of people get stuck at this point. They think just because their client has an objection, they got shut down with a no. But if you know how to overcome that objection, you're gonna be able to get to that yes a lot quicker. Notice my body language, I'm sitting down. Closes happen when you're sitting down. I never signed a contract when I was standing up. And also notice I have a pen and I also have a contract. You cannot sign a contract if you don't have a contract. Bring it to every single meeting that you go to because you never know when the sale is gonna happen. Actually, you do know after this because you're gonna be able to predict the sale and make sure that you don't leave without it. Sitting down, contract, pen on the table, and get ready to use it. I would also like to welcome Elias Macris, Vice President of Wealthy Commercials, to help us in this negotiation. Hey. And he's gonna help us do a mock negotiation. We do this actually all the time, and it's a good thing for you guys also to do before you go into a sales arena to make sure that you are hot and ready for the close. Let's do this. All right, so I gave you our package, I gave you our pricing. Do you have enough information to make a decision? So I like everything that I see here, but um, honestly, it's just completely out of our budget. Um, that looks like twice our budget of our yearly spend, and, and that's not something I think we can do. So I agree with you, budgets are very important. The United States of America is $27 trillion over budget, but it doesn't stop them from building what they need to make. So although it's over your budget, let's do this. You need it, we're the right people. You're gonna have a return on investment here. So I'm asking you to focus not on the current dollars, but on the future dollars. Let's do this, man. So you're telling me that if I invest this $30,000 here, I'm gonna have a return of investment of at least you know, $30,000 back to me? Of course, you're gonna have more than that. I am so confident in my product and service that I'm willing to give you a money back guarantee. If you don't make at least twice as much as you spend with me, I'll give you every penny back. I do this every day. We have clients just like you and I believe in what it is that we're doing. So let's do this. Would you like me to put that in the contract, by the way? Actually, what I, would, I think would be okay in this case is maybe, you know, how about you give me the product, I pay for half of it, and if it does what it says it's gonna do, I'll pay the full amount. And if not, we'll just pay for half and, and I'll keep everything and we'll just go our separate ways. If you're willing to give me a money back guarantee. So first of all, I really appreciate your offer and putting that on the table. Look, I need this payment in order to actually make this for you. And I need to do a good job for you. I'd much rather we pay in full and I give my money back guarantee. Again, you're not gonna lose. I have hundreds of clients just like you. None of them have ever lost. I've given this money back guarantee before, never ever had to never had to take it back. I don't think I'm gonna start with you. Let's get this done, let's sign this, you need it, I have it, let's do this. Do you have anybody I know in the industry that you can give me their phone number that I can call them? Absolutely, right after this meeting, I'm gonna connect you to three of my biggest clients in your exact industry and they're gonna tell you I'm the man. Let's do this, stop hesitating, okay. we're gonna do great work together. Congratulations. You got me. Thank you so much. Great, so I matched all your terms. I put everything into the contract that you needed to. I worked out the payment terms for you that it should be acceptable. Are we ready to do this? Are we ready to sign? I appreciate you doing all those things and I actually really appreciate everything that you brought to the table today. But I do need a week to think about it. Can we schedule maybe a phone call after you get back and, and I get back to work? Maybe we can talk next week? Yeah, sure, that's great. Next week is fine. Let me just ask you a question now. If you were sold on this product, 
you would be signing this contract and not pushing it off to next week. So what would you say that is holding you back here? Um, I think the pricing is a little high. Uh, and, I, and I'm not so sure if maybe I can get the same thing for less. Uh, I, I think maybe I would go with that. But I really like you and your product, but I'm just not so sure about the pricing. It's a little bit high. Listen, I agree with you. It is a high price, but let's be honest, it's not going to put your company under. Look at this beautiful business that you built, sir. I think you're going to do great with this product. I stand behind the product. I put in here the money back guarantee for you. There's no reason why we shouldn't do this today. What's going to happen is next week you're going to get busy. I'm going to get busy and you're going to have another month or quarter without this product that you actually really need. So let's do it now. Feel good about it. I'm the right person. I have what it is that you need. Let's just get out of the way so you can have one less thing to do. Can we do that? I'd like to, but I think I need to check with my partner uh, before I sign anything. And I think you might understand that. Um, so again, if I can speak to my partner, he, sees, he says yes to this, I think we're a go. Cool. I mean, what do you think your partner is going to say? Uh, I think he's going to say it's expensive. I think he's going to say that it's a good product, but I think he's going to say it's expensive. So I agree with you. It is expensive. And you want to tell your partner that this is expensive because this company is the right company. I know your industry. I know what it is that you need. I've done this a thousand times before. I will not let you down. I'm going to kill for you. Let's sign this thing. Let's get it done already. Okay. Congratulations. You're going to absolutely love your new product. Thank you so much for the business. You feel good about it? I'd like some references, but I feel good about yeah, it. Yeah, I'll send you references. Don't worry. Okay. So in a perfect world, let's say you got blessings from everywhere, budget made sense, product makes sense. When would you like delivery of this product? As I told you earlier, I like the product. Um, I'm just not sure if I want it right now. So if you allow me, to, I appreciate you coming here, but let me get back to you and see if this is something that we actually need. Listen, what's making you nervous? There's something that we haven't uncovered because if you were ready, you would sign. So what is that thing? Well, we never really invested in anything like this before, and it's the first time we're doing something like this. So I just wanted to be sure we did some due diligence, you know, before, before we ever, you know, before we put down this type of money like that. So I have a lot of clients in your space. A lot of those clients also did not do this before, but we've had a great relationship with them and a great experience. I know it's a lot of money. I know you're nervous about it, but it's what you need. So let's get this out of the way so you could finally start producing the way that you should. Here, I'm going to put the name of your company over here, Acme Corporation. I put in here a 25% discount. I put in here, look, it was $100,000 a contract. I crossed it off. We're doing now doing $75,000. You twisted my arm off for that one. Let's just do this. Let's get it done. You negotiated with the price. You negotiated the payment terms. I gave you everything you wanted. There's no reason not to do this. Let's sign. I just don't know if I'm ready to sign right now. Um, if you come back to me next week, I probably will have a better idea. If I call up some of your clients, you know, I might feel a little bit more comfortable doing it. Well, right now I'm just, I'm just not comfortable signing. <laughs> I understand. I agree with you. It is a, it's a lot of money. What I'll put in the contract for you is dependent on good client references. Is that okay? So okay. once you hear from my clients, references. Once you hear from my clients, how much they love working with us, how great our product is, you're going to feel great about it. Only then does this become valid. Is that fair? And what about payment? Is that also contingent on that? Can I wait to hear from them before I give any payment? No, you have to pay now. <laughs> I, I have to pay now. Yes. And what if I don't want to go through with the contract? Let me ask you, is the contract going to break you? Is it going to break your company? I don't think so. It's not going to break my company, of course not, but you know, money's money. It's not a sickness though. You have to use money in order to make more money. So the money could either be in your bank and you could look at it and feel good about it, or you could actually get this product that you've been needing for how long? You told me yourself, you've been looking for this for over a year now. I'm the right guy. Let's not add more time to this equation. Let's just get this signed and let's get this done already. Let's go. And when will I have the product by? You're going to have it in two weeks guaranteed. Fair? Can you put that in the contract? Yes, absolutely. Two weeks? Two weeks. So fully my, delivered. So my guys are ready to roll with these videos in two weeks from today. So we'll be filming next week. Guaranteed. Okay. Congratulations. Okay. You're going to love it. You made the right decision. So you see what we're doing here? Just because the client has an objection doesn't mean he's shutting us down. 
They want us to stay in the close. They want to see how far we're willing to go to get this contract. When people see that you are going to go to the end of the world for them to get their business, they're going to give it to you because they're going to trust that you're going to do a great job for them. Don't be pushed back by objections. Power through them. Deal with the uncomfortableness. You know what's really uncomfortable? Going home that night and telling your wife or your husband that you didn't sign the deal. That's what you should be scared of, not the pressure in the close. Great, so I hit your terms, I hit your pricing, I hit your perfect package. Are we ready to roll? Are you ready to sign this contract? Bill, you're pressuring me, honestly. I feel like you're giving me a lot of pressure to do this right now and I'm not that type of guy, I'm not an impulsive buyer and I really think this is why I even got here is because I take my time before I, I spend money. Listen, I respect that. I actually really do and you didn't get to this by you know making bad decisions and I trust you're gonna make a decision here. And please don't mistake my enthusiasm for pressure. I believe in what I'm doing. I know I'm gonna do a great job for you. Let's get this done and let's get this signed. Let's do this. So great, I hit all your terms. I hit your pricing. I hit your package. Went back and forth. I think we're ready to do this. Can I get a signature on this contract? Listen, I really like you and I've heard about what you guys do, but I just was not expecting that number on that contract and to be honest with you I'm just gonna be blown with you I can't afford with this right now I I am I have a very cash intensive business and that type of investment might ruin me on my next shipment listen I agree with you I have the same problem that you do and all my other clients have the same exact problem that you do as well cash is king I'll tell you what I'm gonna do for you usually we request 50% deposit and 50% when we deliver what I'm gonna do for you is I'll bring that down to 25% deposit 25% delivery 25% 30 days after that and 25% 30 days after that. Does that make it a little bit easier on your cash flow? So I only have to pay half even though I'll have my product? Yes. You and then 30 days after that, yeah, that's amazing deal. Yes, you could start using your product right away, start enjoying it, have it start making money for you and pay me with the profit. Sounds good? Wow, thank you. Congratulations. So you like the product? Um, yeah, I like the product, yeah. Pricing is fair? Pricing is, is fair, yeah. You like me, I'm a nice guy. You're a nice guy, but I didn't expect you to bring a contract. Listen, I don't waste time. I believe in what I do. I work with tons of people exactly like you in the exact same industry. I believe in what it is that I have to offer. So I don't like to waste time. Every second that my product is not in your hands, I literally feel like you're losing money. I would feel bad if I didn't sell this product to you today. Let's get it done, let's sign, let's go. Are you ready? Beryl, this is the first time we're meeting, it's been 40 minutes that I'm in front of you and I, I didn't have a chance to, to do some research. Um, frankly, I've never seen anybody come with a contract to the first meeting. I thought we were just here to shake hands. Uh, if you give me a few days though, let me review it. Uh, I could probably have an answer for you then. Absolutely. So when you say review, what does that mean exactly? I need to, to see if this is something that corporate agrees with. I need to see if, if my partner is okay with this. Um, even though he's a minority partner, I'm a majority partner. I just need a few days to, to look at it. I, I don't want, I'm not the type of person who makes a decision right now. So what do you think your partner is going to say to this? I think he's going to ask me to try to bring the price down. So I'll tell you what, you could tell your partner that we started off at $30,000 and you twisted my arm off, which you did, right? You're, neg you're a good negotiator. You got it down to 20 grand. You're getting this below cost price. Your partner's gonna love it. You're gonna feel good about it. I know it's only been 40 minutes, but hey, you gotta appreciate the fact that I don't waste time. I'm also not gonna waste time on delivering this product to you. Let's get this done, let's sign it now, and let's get you in what it is that you need. Let's go, let's sign this. You're good. Congratulations, you're gonna love it. It's gonna be amazing. I'm gonna do a great job and I'm gonna kill for you did there, you have to keep on selling even after they sign the contract. You have to make them feel good even after their signature's on there, even after they gave you their visa card. You have to make sure that they feel good about what it is that they do because you don't want them to come back to you and retrade and redo the deal. You don't want this deal to unwind. You have to make them feel good. You have to make them feel like they made the right decision. And if you believe in what it is that you're selling, you're also feeling good about the fact that they're gonna get what it is that they Buyer just signed the contract, congratulations, but nothing is done yet until we have the cash 
in the bank. So now we're gonna teach you how to actually get payment for your product or services. As you know from our previous chapters, I love credit card because that is the best way to get payment. You're in control. So here's how to get the credit card out of the client's pocket. Congratulations, I'm so excited about this. We're gonna do such a great job for you. By the way, how would you like to pay? American Express, Visa, or MasterCard? We can actually give a 1% discount for paying with credit card. Which one do you wanna use? Um, actually, I believe we work with wires. I can give you uh, my AP department's email address and you can shoot them an invoice and they'll take care of that. I, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna get you an invoice, but I would really appreciate if we could actually do this by credit card. I give a 1% discount, you get the points, everybody wins. I don't have to chase your AP, they don't have to chase me. Do you have a credit card on you by any chance? Um, I know that we might have a company credit card, but I don't keep that on me. No problem, where is it? Uh, I mean, it should be with, the, with our buyer. I mean, he must have it. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a second, go get the card, I'll wait right here. Let's just do this, let's ink this up. We have spent so much time negotiating this. Let me get my deposit so I can start working on this for you. Is that okay? Okay, give me one second. I got the card, but how are you going to use this? How are we gonna be sure this is safe? Yeah, so let me just take down the number and I will not charge you, I promise, until I send you a copy of your contract and until I send you an invoice. Let me just get the card so we can get you set up in my system. Is it American Express or MasterCard or Visa? Um, it's a uh, Visa. Great, does it start with a four? Yes. Go ahead. Four, seven, two, four, yeah. zero, eight, zero, two. Yeah. 8828 yep. 4050. Great expiry. Uh, 0824. Any numbers on the back? 143. Beautiful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you an invoice. I'm not going to charge you until you get all the paperwork. Congratulations. You're going to you're going to love your new product. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for the business. You're going to love your new product. How would you like to pay? Uh, American Express, Visa, Mastercard. What do you usually prefer? Um, actually, we usually pay with check. I mean, that's probably better for you, no? So um, if you give me an invoice, I'll get a check out to you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll get you that invoice. I have to tell you, we really prefer Visa, especially since in your contract, we're actually billing you by cycles. It's just easier this way. Your account's payable, don't have to chase me. I don't have to chase them. Did you have it on you by any chance? Um, I do have a card on me, yeah, but um, I really prefer paying my check. So no problem. Here's what I'm gonna do for you. I'm actually gonna give you a 2% discount for using Visa. You get all the points, and I'm not gonna charge you until I send you invoice and everything. Let's do Visa, so much easier. Do you have it on you? Um, I think I have a card on me, yeah. Beautiful. What does it start with, a three? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Three, seven, two, four. Yep. Zero, nine, zero, two. Yep. Eight, eight, two, eight. Yep. Expiry? Zero, eight, two, four. Three numbers on the back. One, four, three. Beautiful. Congratulations. Feel good about this. You're going to love your new product. It's exactly what it is that you need. Feel, you feel good? I feel great. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you so much for the business. I appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed my sales masterclass thus far. I wanted to end on possibly my favorite chapter, which is God and sales. You might say to yourself, what does God have to do with sales? The answer is absolutely everything. At the end of the day, our job is to work as hard as we can, to get as many leads, to get as many meetings, to get as many appointments. But at the end of the day, it's up to God to give us the blessing to make it work. Let me give you an example. You have a farmer and he has the best seeds and the best soil and the best equipment and the best everything. And he plants each one of those seeds at exactly the right time. Ultimately, he has to rely on God's blessing to make it rain. And once the rain comes, then everything will grow. So you might be beating yourself up that things just aren't working out the way that you need them to work. Maybe that's the time to look up and ask God for his blessing. Ask him to water your crop. Because at the end of the day, that's where all blessings come from. So if you're having a hard time in your business, in your sales career, whatever it is that you're looking to achieve, maybe it's God's way of saying to you that I would like you to ask me for help. And when you do that, you're gonna see that everything starts working magically. You know, I've had times in business where I was just hammering away. I think that you know me a little bit by now. I don't give up very easily. And nothing seemed to be going my way. I wasn't winning any contracts, wasn't winning any deals, wasn't selling anything. 
And in those moments, I've had, I've had them about a half a dozen times in my career. I look up to the sky and I say, you know what, God, I'm doing my best. I'm going to continue to do my best, but I need a little bit of help. And everything else is in your hands. And when you put your success in God's hands, He responds in absolute amazing ways. Everything that we spoke about is great, but without God's blessing, you have nothing. But with God's blessing, you have everything. I hope you enjoyed. God bless and go make your career and your business the best that it could be.